All right. Hey, Martin, uh, what does it say at the very, very top? I'm, I'm, yes and no. I, I don't like memorizing. I'm teaching now, folks. I don't like memorizing stuff unless I absolutely have to. What I'm going to do along the way of this lesson is to show you how, if you can do a bit of arithmetic in your head, you don't have to memorize these. You can derive them in about a second. If, if, if it took 10 seconds to derive them, then maybe I'd say it's worth memorizing them. Just 10 seconds on a test over and over, that adds up. But you can derive them in about a second. Okay? So the first one is what we call the quadratic equation. The basic one is this, y equals x squared. What is that a graph of? You learned this one last year. This is a parabola. Parabola is a quadratic. It goes through 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 2, 4, and then 3. I think 9 is, is I think my graph goes 8 high, so 9 is 1 off the graph. Did your teacher last year teach you one one two four three nine? Okay, I don't know if every teacher does. When I when I teach, I, I, in fact, I think Mr. Gerard tweaks it a bit. His is uh, one 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 three one six or something like. It. I, I memorize one one two four three nine. Those are the key points. In fact, when I teach it in math eleven, Blaine, we call it our mantra. A mantra is a chant that you repeat over and over to relax yourself. But I stole that word. For a parabola, because I said anytime I'm doing a parabola, I'm thinking one, one, two, four, three, nine. One squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine. Uh, what's the standard form of a parabola? Remember, y equals a bracket x minus p all squared plus q. Remember that bad boy from last year where p and q, Leslie told you the vertex. Why was that minus? Because in the brackets was backwards. Uh, a told you if it was positive or negative. A told you which way it opened. And it also told you the vertical stretch, what you had to do with that 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. There is also general form for a quadratic equation. That's the one that you're used to seeing when you want to solve a quadratic equation. It was this one, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. That one is handier to do math with. Standard form is handier to graph with. And remember doing that thing called completing the square last year where you could rewrite parabolas as standard form? Um, we won't be doing it again this year, but in calculus you probably reviewed it when you uh, did conics, those of you that are in calculus. Okay. Uh, just because I'm a nerd and I like it so much, hey, what is the quadratic formula? x equals what? Negative b plus or minus, what is it, but? I'm going to give you candy for that. Can we say it backwards? A2 overall? Are you serious, Mr. Good? Sure. C, A, 4, minus square B, root square, minus plus B, negative, equals X. I'm enough of a nerd. We, we love the quadratic formula, Blaine. To us in math, it's almost, I tell my students when I show it to them in grade 11, it's almost like iambic pentameter in English. It's almost poetry. It's one of the only times in math, and you guys don't know this because you don't know all that much math yet. I got a math degree. It's one of the only times in math where you can get a formula that works for anything, any quadratic. There is no cubic formula. They've looked long and hard. In fact, they spent about 200 years looking, and at the turn of the century, a mathematician actually proved that there isn't one. You can't find one. There is no to the fourth power quartic formula. There is no to the fifth power formula. And in fact, in all sorts of other equations, you'll notice, well, have I given you an equation-solving formula this year? I could give you steps. So for exponential equations, I said, well, get the exponent by itself and then take the log of both sides. But there was no formula, you have to tweak it a little bit. Uh, for log equations, I couldn't give you a standard formula. So we, we like it. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Make that a little larger.
Clara, you do it differently in Germany. I believe you have an equation that has the letter P and the letter Q in it or something like that to solve a quadratic. If you can solve it that way using the P and Q method, good, I don't care. In, in North America, we use this thing here, and you don't need to freak out. I'll show you how it works another day. So just copy it out if you want to. Um, although, you know what? This unit, you won't need it. And the unit that you do need it, you'll have a formula sheet by then which actually has it on here. In other words, Steph, you don't need to technically memorize this in Math 12, but it's so important. This is one of the few times that my nerdishness overcomes my unwillingness to memorize stuff. Okay. Domain. What's the domain of this particular parabola? In fact, what's the domain of any parabola? All reals. It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, we're going to define that a little more fussy. What we're really saying is this. Madeline, in this generic standard form for parabola, you can put in any x value. No extraneous roots. No rejections. No... Uh, Martin, you always get a date on this graph. Ah, the smile on his face, the relief on his face. Okay, so we don't write all reals, though. We write uh, x belongs to the set of all real numbers. That's the shortest, well, that's the second shortest way to write all reals. Those of you who are in calculus, you know the shortest way is that. But that's interval notation, and so you're not going to use that. What's the range? Well, first of all, what's the range of this particular parabola? Greater than or touching zero. Now, this is a specific example. Can you generalize? What's your range here? Depends on whether it opens up or down. Good point. Okay? So, I'm going to say this. Y is greater than or equal to zero for our specific one. For the generic one, it would be y is greater than or equal to, or it could be less than or equal to. Uh, but the letter P, sorry, not the letter P, Mr. Duick, mind your P's and Q's. The letter Q, uh, the y coordinate of the vertex told you what your bottom or your top was. I'm not going to give you a generic one. like I'll give you specifics, but we're just trying to refresh your memory from last year. And most of you, since you did the parabola at the beginning of the year last year, we're brushing some serious cobwebs off of your brain. Vertex. What's the vertex of this particular parabola? What, comma, what? What's the vertex of this parabola? What, comma, what? Okay, let's do that one generic. The vertex is P comma Q, and if there are no numbers in those locations, it's 0, comma, 0. Do you remember the equation of the axis of symmetry? What was the axis of symmetry? That was the line that ran right down the middle of your parabola and exactly bisected it. Pardon me? Uh, that's the slope of it. I heard it correctly over here. Angelo! You just impressed me. What? Isn't it y equals 0 because it's vertical? No, it's not. And this is one thing we got to recognize. Okay? You were right the first time. Vertical lines are x equals. Horizontal lines are y equals. So the equation of the axis of symmetry, except Angelo, I'm going to tweak ours just a little bit. I'm going to say it's actually x equals Whatever slide your vertex has done, x equals p, except what's my x-coordinate of my vertex here? Zero. So for this specific one, Angelo, x equals zero. If I want to generalize it, x equals p. And then there was key points. For the parabola, the key points were the vertex, and then they were 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. Um, Blaine, what I'm really saying is, Remember we said that the parabola was based on y equals x squared? What's 1 squared? That's why 1 comma 1. What's 2 squared? What's 2 squared? That's why 2 comma 4. What was the third one I said? 3, 9? Can you, can you see why I sort of said you can memorize the 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, or it's sort of here so you can derive it. What we, what we did last year was when you were asked to graph the parabola, 
you did not make a table of values. What you did is you found the vertex and then you moved those key points. That's the strategy we're going to bring to this unit for generic graphs. For a generic graph, Chelsea, we're going to learn its key points, either just read it from the graph if they give us a shape, or if it's an equation that we know, we'll memorize, derive it, we'll memorize, derive it. And then we'll say, okay, we can figure out how this graph has been moved left or right, how it's been moved up or down. And once I figure out where this graph starts, sort of like the vertex from the parabola, I'm going to do its key points for that graph. It's going to cut way down on a lot of your arithmetic. You're going to find by the end of this, you'll be going, oh, this is nice. Uh, example two, the square root function. Did I get everything on example one? Key points? Yeah, okay. Example two, the square root function. Strangely enough, y equals the square root of x. Oh, I guess I have a y equals down there, Mr. Glick. y equals the square root of x. What does this look like? Well, what can't I take the square root of? Negatives. I've probably already figured out my domain, by the way. So let's start with positives. What's the square root of 0? So this graph is going to go through 0, 0. What's the square root of 1? 1. What's the square root of 2? Yucky decimal. In fact, what's the next nice number to take the square root of? 4 over, uh, what is the square root of 4? 2. What's the next nice number to take the square root of? 9, which is 1 off my graph. What is the square root of 9, Alex? It looks like this. Here's how I remember it. Unfortunately, the, this one would not make Greenpeace happy, but that's okay. Remember when you were little kids and you were drawing little sunsets? So you would draw a little sun like that. And then if it was like a little beach, what was that supposed to be? A seagull? This is the wounded seagull, if you chop a wing off. Okay? So there's a seagull. Greenpeace is not happy, but that's a square root graph. It's a wounded seagull. It is. Sorry. Fine. Um, oh, wait. Pardon me? Uh, no, square root is defined as the positive answer when you take the square root of a function. In other words, this is defined as the positive. Now, you are also noticing, I'll get, can I get a little math speak for you? This is the top half of the inverse of a parabola. Is square rooting the inverse of squaring? Yeah. Oh, except the square root, it's defined as a well-known positive answer. Okay? By the way, um, key points. What did you tell me the square root of 0 was? What was the square root of 1? 1. What was the next one we did? Comma. 2, and then 9, comma. In fact, if you, in Math 11, I made my kids memorize 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, and the reason was by doing that, they'd also memorize the square root, which is 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3, which, oh, how do you find an inverse? Switch the x and y around? Really? Are they inverses of each other, the key points? Yes, they are. Oh, but instead of a vertex, we have an origin. In fact, you know what the origin is? 0, 0. In other words, Kellen, if they asked me to graph the square root graph, but they've moved it around, if I can figure out where the origin has moved to, from there, I'll just count 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3. I won't do any arithmetic. I'll just 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3. There's my dots. Uh, what did we say the domain was? Everything bigger than or touching 0. Pardon me? I can't hear you. Oh, it's greater than or equal to uh, which one? Uh, Q is uh, rationals. You could say X is greater than or equal to... Uh, 
the whole number system. Natural numbers from Math 10 are 1, 2, 3, 4. Whole number, you add a 0. I can remember because 0 looks like a whole. whole. I'm serious. You saw me thinking for a second there. Literally, my brain was going, okay, natural and whole. Which one has the 0? Zero? 0 goes with whole because it looks like a whole. The whole numbers. You guys not figure that one in grade 10 when you have to memorize those stupid number sets, which I always thought were kind of a waste of time. But anyways, uh, hey, what's my range? Also the same thing. Everything above or touching zero. Key points. One one two four four. One one four two nine three. Oh, and zero zero your origin. What I mean by at the top when I said memorize these, here's what I'm gonna say. Chels, if you run across across a graph that looks like this, hopefully you'll say wounded seagull. That's probably a square root graph, and I'll see if I can figure out how it's been moved. If you run across a graph that looks like this, hopefully you'll say that's parabola. Oh, and we've broadened our math horizons. If you run into a graph that looks like this, Hopefully you'll say, I bet you that's an inverse parabola because it looks like they switched the x and y's. In other words, we're going to broaden our what's out there. Memorize, recognize when you see it is really what I should have put at the top of the page, but that was too much writing. Graph 3. Here's your first new one, the semicircle. I'm going to give you a specific example of a semicircle. It's going to look like this. Do a great big square root, and then inside the square root, you're going to have 25 minus x squared. Okay, so just take the square root of 25 and the square root of x squared. Isn't that the same as just 5 minus x? No, you can't square root one term at a time inside a square root. That's as simplified as it gets. But we're going to try and generate some numbers here. The first number, if I don't know what a graph looks like, the first numbers I always try are 0. What's 0 squared, Justin? What's 25 take away 0? What's the square root of 25? So when x is 0, y is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's a point on our graph. You know another, well, how good are you guys at arithmetic? What other numbers could you put in there so that this would work out evenly? Five? Good suggestion. What's five squared? What's 25 take away 25? What's the square root of zero? So you're saying when x is five, y is zero? Okay, I like that. Oh, you know what? Not only positive five, you know what else would work? Not only positive five, because we're squaring. Negative five squared is also going to give me 25. 25 take away 25 is zero. You know what? Negative five is going to go through zero high. Justin, what? Three. Nice catch. What's three squared? What's 25 take away nine in your head? 16. What's the square root of 16? So when x is three, y is? So let's go three over four up. Hey, you know what? Not only positive 3, negative 3 gives you the same thing. It gives you 25, take away 9, square root of 16. Negative 3 is also 4 high. Um, 3 gave me a 4 as an answer. Why don't I try plugging in a 4? I, I, that would be logical to try. What's 4 squared? 16. What's 25 take away 16? Square root of 9. Oh, you know what? Not only in this graph does 3 give me a 4, 4 gives me a 3. That's a fluke. I made this one up for you guys nicely so that does work. That does not work with any other semicircle, unfortunately. So you're saying 4 over 3 up and also negative 4 over negative 3 up. If I connect the dots, do you see why I called this the semicircle graph? Looks like that. Oh, uh, huge. Huge. Con conic uh, semicircle is a subgraph of a group of graphs called conics. 
they include the parabola, which you already looked at, uh, the circle, the ellipse, and the hyperbola. They show up all over the place in physics. In fact, almost any type of architecture that involves curves, like bridges or the church arches or any of those, those are almost all conic sections. That the, they, they distribute forces very, very nicely. They have wonderful force distributing properties. Our planets move in ellipses. Orbits are circular, or semicircular, well, not quite semicircle, but circular. Uh, comets move in ellipses or hyperbola. They show up all over the place. Huge. You just don't know that yet, but huge. Um, hey, Martin, what's the radius of this semicircle? Count. That's the diameter. What's the radius of this semicircle? <coughs> Louder, please. Five. Um, look at the equation that I gave you. Can you see a five hidden in that equation anywhere at all? Where, Chels? What do you think if I wanted a semicircle of radius seven, what would my equation be? Big square root of 49 minus x squared. Hey, what if I wanted a radius 10, big square root of 100 minus x squared? In fact, if you want the standard form of a semicircle, it's this. y equals great big square root of whatever you want the radius to be squared minus x squared. A semicircle doesn't have a vertex like the parabola. You know what it does have? It has the center. What's the center of our semicircle here? What, comma, what? Zero, zero, which is a really nice one. In other words, if I knew a graph was a semicircle and I knew the radius, if I could figure out where the new center was, if they moved it around, say the center was 7, 9, and the radius was 4, I would go 7 over, 9 up, and then I would go 4 right, 4 left, 4 up, and draw a semicircle. That, that's how you do a semicircle. You don't actually you know this table of values things that Justin and I did. You don't do that. It was nice to find our first one. Oh, I'll try a 3, I'll try a 4, I'll try a 5. You don't do that. We find the center, find the radius, and good enough. Oh, what's the radius? The radius of ours is 5. The radius of this one is R. Martin, the other reason I like this graph is it's got a more interesting domain. Our specific graph, how far left does it go? What's that? Negative 5. Touching? Yep. How far right? Touching? Okay, how do I write everything between and including negative 5 and positive 5? This is the one that we did it this way last year. You did the smallest number first. Domain, is that x or y? x. Leave a space, put an x there because it's domain. You did the bigger number next, leave a space again. By the way, can you see that the x is between negative 5 and positive 5, which is kind of what I'm trying to show with my diagram. And then if you always did the smaller number first and you always did the bigger number next, it was always less than, less than. Oh, but Alex, did you say we're touching? Oh, or equal to, or equal to. Now, what's this statement really saying? Cover up the right half, and it's saying x is bigger than negative 5, which is true, everything to the right of negative 5, and at the same time, everything to the left of positive 5. That's the mathematical way to say it's in between those two numbers. I don't really memorize that. I, I just know if I do blame... If I do the smaller number first, and then the x, and the bigger number is less than, less than. And that part of it kind of makes sense. And x is sitting between the two numbers. I want all the points between those two numbers. So now that we figured that out, let's see if we can do the range. How low does my graph go? Zero. How high? Touching and touching? Smaller number. Range is y. Bigger number. Less than, less than, touching, touching. By the way, if I wanted to generalize this, negative radius less than or equal to x less than or equal to positive radius, 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to whatever the positive radius is.
This one for key points does not have a little mantra. Sorry. This one, find the center, and find the radius. Pardon me? Can the range? Um, what do you think would cause a semicircle to open upside down, do you think? Come on, bring the parabola back home here. Putting a negative in front of the whole thing? Really? Yeah, we're going to generalize all those parabola rules. We're going to generalize them to any function. And yes, you can flip it. Put a negative in front. Okay. What you didn't do last year, Alex, was you didn't do very much of flipping stuff horizontally. And the reason is a parabola is symmetrical. If I spin a parabola, I still get a parabola, which isn't very much fun. You flip them vertically. And this one, flipping it horizontally, won't make a difference because it's so symmetrical. Ah, but we will eventually have non-symmetrical graphs. All the stuff you learned how to do up and down and vertically, we're going to add uh, horizontally as well. And the nice thing is, it all is going to tie together. In fact, I almost argue that it makes the parabola easier when you figure out why the parabola behaves weird in certain situations. No, it doesn't actually. It's behaving weird because you have to be specific instead of a general rule. The cubic. Graph number four. The cubic is y equals x cubed. Once again, I'm going to stick in some basic numbers. And once again, I always try zero. What's zero to the third power? Yeah, this graph's going to go through zero, zero. What's one to the third power? One, it's going to go through one, one. What's two to the third power? Eight, this is going to go through two, comma, eight. Sally, what's three to the third? 27, off my graph, who cares? Oh, you know what? Since we just got too big going right, let's go left. What's negative one to the third power? What's negative one times negative one times negative one? Which one, negative or positive, folks? Okay. Negative 1 goes through negative 1. Oh, and what's negative 2 to the third power? What's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2? Not positive 8. Negative 8. And Sally, what's negative 3 to the third power? Negative 20. Is that off my graph? Okay. The cubic looks like this. I call it the John Travolta function. What else am I supposed to? I'm, I'm limited. It's you know, it's not a common shape. So John Travolta graphs. <sighs> okay. This one doesn't have a vertex because a vertex is where the graph turns around on itself. This graph does have a center though. Where does this graph look like it's centered symmetrically? Zero zero. What's the domain? What's the range? People, people on the video, anybody who's away today is watching this on video. Is going, what the heck is everyone laughing about? Come to class if you're away. So. Um, we do like this in that it has really the simplest possible domain and range. All reals. All reals. Oh, Mr. Duick, why? What that's saying is I can put in any x value between negative infinity and positive infinity. And any answer you want to get, a y value, I can find an x value that will give you that answer. Those types of graphs, those types of functions have a special name, but I can't remember what they're called. They're not one to one, they're not on to, they're not homogeneous, they're something else. Oh, key points. Um, zero, zero, one, one, two, eight. 
And then I'll trust that you can remember also negative 1, negative 1, and negative 2, negative 8, but I'm not going to write those down. I'll figure that out because it's a John Travolta graph. Do I have to memorize those key points? Or can you just derive them by going, what is 0 cubed? What is 1 cubed? What is 2 cubed? Yes, you can. That's why, you know, if you're someone who has to memorize things, fine. I, I honestly, Connor, don't. I derive them every time because I can do a bit of arithmetic in my head. Next one. Graph number five. The absolute value function. Looks like this. That's the symbol for absolute value. What does this graph look like? The absolute value looks like a V shape. You're saying the absolute value looks like a V shape? It would be great if there was an easy way that I could remember that the absolute value looks like a V shape. But I'm a terrible math teacher. I can't come up with anything. Um, what's the absolute value of 0? Zero? 0. What's the absolute value of 1? One? 1. What's the absolute value of 2? Two? 2. What's the absolute value of 3? I think I've spotted the pattern. Uh, let's go in the other direction. What's the absolute value of negative 1? 1. Negative 2. 2. Negative 3. 3. In fact, it looks like this. Sesame Street is brought to you today by the letter D. Martin may be wondering, what's the point of this function as well? Those of you that are in physics know how often we chuck a negative and just take the absolute value of our answer. We don't call it taking the absolute value of our answer. We call it a scalar. Right? We, but we actually do use this all the time. Uh, vertex, 0, 0. In fact, doesn't this sort of, kind of, look similar to the parabola? It's got the same domain or range. Domain. All reals range y greater than or touching zero. In the old math 12 course and in the conics unit, pardon me? Justin, question? No? Okay. We used to be interested in the slope of the arms. I stuck this on just to review with you what slope was because technically you haven't seen it since math 10, although you might have done it a little bit in math 11 or in chem. Um, this right-hand arm, what's the slope? What's the rise over the run of the right-hand arm? 1. What's the slope here? Negative 1. So I'm going to write down, uh, what letter do we use for slope? M. Why? Because not all math is done by English-speaking people. Uh, M, I believe, is from the French. Uh, it, who's my immersion students? Anybody know the word for steepness? I think it has something to do with mountain or Mont Blanc or something like that. Anyways, not all... English, all, not all math was done by English speaking people. I think it's from the French, or it could be from the Latin. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, what did you say the slopes were? Plus or minus one, depending on which arm you look at. Hey, what are the key points of the absolute value graph? One, one, two, two, three, three. Justin, can you figure out the next key point? Uh, how about. Four four. <laughs> four four. What will the next one be? Five five. Now Justin actually said how about negative one, comma one. I don't memorize that. I know that the absolute value graph is shaped like a V. So you know what? If I write that, I can get the rest. Just flip it over, right? In fact, I'll be honest, I don't even memorize these. I can absolute value is an easy enough function to do in my head that I would just try zero, one, two, and three. Somebody yawning? Oh. The linear function, y equals x. Uh, this is a line that goes through 1, 1, 2, 2, well, goes through 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, 8, 8, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2. It looks like that. That's the simplest possible line, y equals x. 
And then in Math 10, we generalized it. Do you remember what slope-intercept form, what the equation template was equal to? Y equals what x plus what? Okay. Hugely overrated. Who's in calculus? You've learned a better form, have you not? Point slope form, have you learned that one yet? If you haven't yet, you will be way more flexible. In fact, they're finally in the new Math 10 curriculum, which is uh, this year. They're doing point slope form. Good for them. Hey, what's the y intercept? 0, comma b. In my specific graph here, 0, comma 0. What's the slope? The number in front of the x. What's the domain of our particular line? All reals? Does that mean every single line has a domain of all reals? There's one specific line that does not. Uh, negative? I think that'll have a domain of all reals still. It's a good guess, a good thought. Which line would not have a domain of all reals? Who said that? What? Vertical. Because it only has one x value. It doesn't move left, right, or all. So let's pretend we're going to ignore the vertical, and we're going to say the domain of any other line is all reals. And the range of any other line is also all reals, unless it's a horizontal line. Let's pretend we're ignoring the two extremes. What's the x-intercept? How do I find an x-intercept? Mathematically. Remember how? Angelo. Okay, I'm just going to write down here, let y equals 0 and solve. Uh, ooh, wait a minute. My physics 12 students. Put a 0 right there in your mind and get the x by itself. Negative b over m comma 0. I don't memorize that, Hannah. I can derive it from this because I've done so much physics and rearranging it. Remember how hard that was at the beginning of physics 11? And now you're like, oh, please, I can do this in my sleep just about? Yeah, it's a useful skill. But for what it's worth, if they ever said, what is the generic x-intercept of a line? There it is. Uh, equation of a vertical line, x equals or y equals for a vertical line, Angelo. Remember? Yeah. x equals, and I'll say uh, a, uh, some number. You know what the equation of a horizontal line is? y equals b. I did use b because it is the y-intercept. That's how high that line is going to be. So. By the way, a horizontal line has a fancy schmancy name. It's also called the constant function. And those of you that have done physics 11 or are doing physics 12 say, oh, yeah. When the v was steady, we called that a constant velocity. Or when the distance versus time graph was steady, that was a constant velocity. That is the constant function. OK. Oh, constant function function? Didn't see that word there. I'll do that. Point slope form. Really handy. Well, it used to be really handy in Math 12. It's not quite as handy as it used to be, but really handy in calculus. There's a better form than y equals mx plus b. You see, for this to work, and if you want to graph it, b can't be a fraction, because how, ha how high is 17 over 3 along your y-axis? You're kind of guessing and eyeballing. So point-slope form says this. If your graph goes through a point, we're going to call it x1, x1, Mr. Duick, comma, y1. If you know any point on your graph and you know the slope, the equation is this. Calculus, has Mr. Camozzi showed you that one yet? He probably will. Have you guys talked about tangent lines yet? This is by far the best equation to find a tangent line with. 
because you already know the point on the tangent line. They gave that to you in the question because they said, find the point at x equals 7, comma, and all you're doing then is finding the derivative, plugging in the slope, and it's really plug and chuck. It's the best way to find a tangent line. So you're going, tangent line, huh? Well, huh? Now then I wrote down in the Blue Alberta book, try number page 5, numbers 1 to 3, and number 10. Am I good with that? Let me see. Page five, one to one, two, three, and number ten. Oh, sure. That's only about ten minutes worth of homework, and I think I did that on purpose when I set this up, because I also think that some of you were probably thinking. Hey, Mr. Duick, I'd like to maybe do work on my log review or do a bit of studying or something like that. Remember, on Wednesday, your log review is also due. That's uh, this big thing here, right? Okay. And I'm going to turn you loose, but just give me one second. 